I'll be going through just some of the findings of the tax working group. They'll, to do the entire thing would take more than a day, so, and we don't have that. So I'll be just skipping over some of the things. And obviously, if you I have questions, I appreciate if you leave those to the end. If you have questions, we can go into more depth in some of those areas. <coughs> so. Um, That's better. Um, so what I want to do is first of all just quickly look at what the tax burden group is. Um, I would like to focus on the problem of high inequality because I think that's a really important aspect of a, of a tax system, what it does to combat high inequality. Then I'll look at some of the less reported um, aspects of the, of the tax burden group's report, um, um, which is the reporting is focused almost entirely on capital gains um, and you can see a list there finally I'll come back to capital gains I know that's what you're all waiting for so this will keep you in the room until the end um, <laughs> and as time permits I'll, I'll both just have a quick sketch of what it's like uh, but also some frequently asked questions um, like by uh, Simon Bridges and others about um, the, um, about taxing income from capital gains. Bill, can you talk a bit louder? Oh, okay. We don't have a microphone, so. <coughs> Sorry? It's not working. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, just keep on reminding me if you can't hear me. Can you see the, the text on that? Okay. We, at least you've got one sensory organ working then. Um, so, the tax working group. Um, it was, the tax working group was set up, as you probably know, as a result of um, various things going on in the election. Um, and it, this was chaired by Michael Cullen with ten other members. Six of them were tax experts, a mixture of accountants, lawyers, one academic and a consultant. Um, there was the chief executive of Business New Zealand, a Māori businesswoman, an ecological economist who focused largely on the environmental areas, and, and me. Um, the terms of reference were over two or three pages, but the heart of it was to examine further improvements in the um, structure, fairness, and balance of the tax system, um, which is a fairly broad scope. Um, but it was limited by saying that the following are outside the scope of the um, inquiry, and you need to bear this in mind that this limited what the tax worm group would do. So, the following are outside the scope increasing any income tax that's both personal income taxes and company taxes or the rate of GST. <coughs> we weren't allowed to think about an inheritance tax or any other changes that would apply to the taxation of the family home or the land underneath it. And finally, we're not allowed to. Uh, to address the adequacy of the personal tax system and its interaction with the welfare system, which was largely handed to the Welfare Expert Advisory Group, which is just reported back to. Um, we had a quite extensive secretariat from um, officials from the IRD and the Treasury, and we had an independent expert advisor, Andrea Black. Is Andrea, has Andrea <coughs> made it this evening? Um, I think she had other, another engagement, but she played a very useful role. She had, has a background in both IRD and uh, Treasury, very knowledgeable about taxation, has written a blog, had, had a blog on it and so on. Um, we reported back on the 1st of February after a year of deliberations and um, two rounds of consultation including um, uh, three, it was in total three reports. So, um, <coughs> Moving on to this, the problem of high and continually high inequality. Um, this graph is probably familiar to you in, in one form or another. You, you'll be aware that during the 1980s through to the mid-1990s, inequality in New Zealand rose very steeply. And what we see there is that um, it rose to a peak in, a, in the late 90s, <coughs> fell slightly during the 2000s, and... and this is debated, but in my view, it's fairly clear that it rose again from the, uh, the late 2000s to the present, um, and even more so when you take into account housing. 
Um, so we have this record of high inequality, and the, and the key point from this is that whatever governments have done since the mid-90s has not reduced that very high level of inequality. And we are now right in the, amidst the, the top, the worst end of inequality in the OECD. So this is a problem that has not been addressed and requires addressing. And the tax system is one of the tools, not the only tool by any means, one of the tools that can be used for addressing it. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you is about addressing inequality. So if we look at how effective our personal ta income tax system and our welfare system, and the two taken together, are at reducing income inequality, um, we, we get the following. And what we're looking at here is how much they reduce the Gini coefficient um, for, for disposable household income corrected for the size of the house, household. Um, and this is basically 2014-15 um, data. So here's the income tax system, and, and you'll have to forgive the very small print there. I don't think even I can read it, actually, but um, just trying to get all the OECD there into one graph. You'll see there that New Zealand is right at the bottom, meaning that we are sixth worst at reducing income inequality through our personal income tax system. If you look then at our income support system, so that's benefits, accommodation, supplement, things like that, plus working for families, tax credits, we're again in a similar position. Neither of these systems work particularly, work very efficiently. And in fact, we, in both cases, we're about half as good as the top at reducing inequality through those systems. And no surprise, if you put the two together, we're, we're still down there at the bottom. So even now, our personal income tax system and our uh, welfare system, which needs revenue from the tax system to function, <laughs> are doing very little compared to the rest of the OECD in reducing in income inequality. And in fact, it's got worse over the years. Um, this graph on the right comes from uh, Brian Perry's um, annual household income uh, survey uh, report uh, published by MSD, and you'll see there <coughs> that's the, uh, the uh, reduction of the Gini coefficient um, um, as a percentage over the years from the mid-1980s to the present. And you see, as you can see there, there's a steady downward trend. And in fact, and in fact um, the report puts it as the inequality reducing power of the tax and transfer system on market income inequality has steadily declined for New Zealand from 27% to 17% over the last three decades from 1985 to 2015 using the Gini coefficient. And another piece of work, much more re um, uh, quite recently by Matt Nolan, um, found that the tax and transfer changes accounted for nearly 40% of the increase of inequality between 1988 and 2013. <coughs> so our tax system is just not doing the job we should expect it to do in reducing inequality. If you, that's just the income tax system. If you then add on GST, and you can see here, this line here is the way that it reduces, the, the way the, the effective tax rate on household income. And as you'll see here, these are the wealthiest, the, the richest households, these are the poorest households. It's heavily regressive. The tax rate is around 12% at this end of the spectrum, around 6% at this end of the spectrum. <coughs> Higher income households are effectively taxed at a lower rate than low income households, largely because they are able to save and low income households are not. The result of adding together personal income taxes and GST is this. <coughs> so what we see is that at this end of the spectrum, the effective tax rate is sort of in the low 20% range. At this end, it's about 31%. So it is barely progressive over, that, over, the, over all households. It's only when you add in uh, the uh, transfer, the welfare system, that we have anything like a progressive system. And so it ends up, these black dots, so the, the, the net value of those, 
that gives pr progressivity, but as we know, that's, even that is a, a weak progressivity in terms of uh, the, the OECD. It's a good place to be rich. The top tax rate at 33% is the sixth lowest in the OECD. The average in the OECD is 43%, and 10 percentage points higher. We have the system of so-called imputation of company taxes. So all company taxes credit, credited back to the shareholders when they get their dividends. The only other place that really does this in a substantial way is Australia. All other countries have systems that effectively are double taxing um, company income. So you receive it, you receive the dividends, less income, less company tax, and then you're taxed again on, on that net amount. Um, we have the highest proportion of revenue in the OECD raised from GST, which you see was, is quite regressive. And, of course, income from capital gains is largely untaxed, with one or two exceptions, which don't actually raise very much money at all. So, how do we go about reducing inequality? Well, one is that we can deal with poverty if we had a sufficiently generous welfare system. We don't. We have an ongoing problem with, with poverty. Tax is one of the most effective ways, and I would say along with stronger unions and collective bargaining, to reduce high income inequality. So you can use the welfare system to address poverty, but at the high end, if you're thinking about people with very high incomes, really the only way to address that through these systems is through the tax system. Taxing capital gains as proposed by the Tax Working Group would be significantly prog progressive in addressing some of these issues. And you can see this by the incidence of the, the types of assets that would, be, that would be subject to the capital gains tax. So this is assets, all assets owned by households, excluding their family home and the land under it, excluding cash and deposits, and excluding um, uh, um, household durables, so um, fridges, cars, boats, paintings, those kinds of things. And you'll see here that 70% of that wealth is held by the top 10%. Of the wealthiest 10% of households. The next 10% is um, pretty well to do, but significantly below the top 10%. When you get to the other end of the, of the spectrum, there's virtually nothing there. Right. So what you can say is that most people, the majority of the population will be un unaffected or barely affected by this capital gains tax. And this Diesel is quite wealthy. So um, in 2014-15, which is where the data comes from, the average 2.5 million in taxable assets per household. So don't, don't forget that excludes the home, which would add a significant amount to that. So this is, this is reasonably, um, I mean, these aren't super rich people, though amongst them will be, but they are wealthy by New Zealand standards. What other ways could we use to uh, make the tax system more inequality reducing and, and you know, get us past this era in which we seem to just live with very high income inequality? Well, we could raise top personal income tax rates, but as you know, that was, as I explained before, that was ruled out by terms of reference. And even more disturbing, um, the ministers, when they released the report, made a media statement saying this remains the case. So they have ruled out raising those top tax rates, well, who knows how long, but certainly into the next term, I would have thought. Um, you could, we can reduce bottom tax rates or raise the threshold so that tax rates come in, uh, um, higher tax rates come in later, and I'll talk about this in a, later on. Uh, and that's what the tax working group gave as one possible um, thing, that one possible way to spend the income <coughs> from a capital gains tax. But 
how we said, overall, the personal tax change discussed in this report are likely to have a minor impact on income inequality. It was about 0.5% decrease in Gini coefficient. A material reduction in income inequality through the personal tax system would require broader income tax changes, including an increase in the top personal tax rate, the top personal mar marginal rate. Such a change is beyond the scope of the term, of the group's terms of reference. You could also think about land taxes or wealth taxes. Um, the group discussed recently seriously a GST on financial transactions, but in the end, recommended none of those. An inheritance tax, which is probably is one of the most important ones in terms of preventing intergenerational pass-on of wealth um, was ruled out by the terms of reference. So, as designed, the tax on, inc on um, the income from capital gains would raise approximately 3.4 billion per year if it was in place right now. So this is 4.2% um, of revenue um, treasury calculated or about, I think it was about 1.2% of, of GDP. Um, it, would, it would be quite variable because it goes up and down with house, house um, pricing bubbles and that kind of thing, um, but that was an average figure they, they calculated. That's a useful amount, 3.4 billion, but if you think about what's needed to eradicate poverty, to restore housing, to uh, restore our health system, our education system, build infrastructure and so on, it doesn't actually go a long way. It's even less sufficient if it, if it is then uh, presented as a revenue neutral pack package as the tax room group was asked to present. Although it did say when it did so that it was actually up to the government to decide how to spend that money. And, and I think we, the take home from this is that if the government does not, not succeed in, a cap, in bringing in a capital gains tax of this nature, it seems that high inequality, high income inequality and insufficient revenue will remain for many years a permanent but avoidable feature of New Zealand society and a blight on our society. Even if it succeeds, more will need to be done. So let me now go on to some of the less reported aspects of the report and I'll go through these in reasonably, reasonably quickly um, uh, and so you'll just have to hold on to your seats and, and listen carefully um, because uh, uh, time doesn't permit much more than that. Uh, so first of, all, first of all, environmental taxes, there's some quite long term thinking in this um, and the main contribution is to pro propose a framework that can be used to assess whether or not a tax is the best way to address uh, environmental problems or whether it would be better to use uh, regulation or education or those other kinds of means. So I looked at what might be favourable attributes for a tax, what might be essential, essential attributes, what might be design principles such as making sure that you address Māori rights, that you address distributional impacts which are a big issue in many environmental taxes and so on. Um, several taxes were assessed on those criteria, greenhouse gases, water pollution, water abstraction, solid waste and road transport, and it suggested in the long run that we should be considering um, what is called a, a, a natural capital enhancement tax, which is an, a, a modified form of land tax that uh, is based on the idea of an environmental footprint tax, looking at the uh, use of the land and whether it is uh, um, ecologically sound and so on. Um, business taxes uh, were another area of discussion apart from, of course, the, capital, the tax and capital gains. Um, we early on ruled out lowering um, the company tax rate, which is currently at 28%. Um, it was lowered in 2008 and again in 2010, and it's significantly lower than it was in the 1980s. But we could find no evidence that this has led to economic benefits. Um, so there seemed no rationale to, to lower that. Um, one of the problems of having it different from the top personal tax rate, the 33%, is that gap is used by the wealthy to avoid tax. Um, one of the tax experts said 
that effectively for wealthy people, the 28% rate is their top effective tax rate. Um, and a lot of that is done by the use of, uh, of capital gains, the absence of a tax on the income from capital gains. <coughs> Our company head, um, headline tax rate, that 28%, is one of the highest in the OECD. But if you think about that imputation I told you about before, where the tax gets credited back to the shareholders, our company tax rate is almost irrelevant to, uh, to local shareholders, and it's one of the lowest tax rates, if you take that whole package, one of the lowest tax rates on company income in the OECD, um, particularly for local shareholders. Um, it's irrelevant to them other than for the purposes of avoidance, as I just mentioned. Um, one, of the take, one of the things I learned from being on the tax rate, and I learned quite a lot, um, was that officials have a great deal of trouble in modelling the economic effects of tax changes. So, you know, in 2010, for example, we were told that a whole lot of this, these tax reductions will be paid off by accelerated GDP growth. Well, actually, their models are just not good enough for that, and, um, and it's very hard to predict what those effects will be. So, when you read about these things, I would treat them with the greatest of scepticism. They did do some preliminary modelling um, based on an Australian model, uh, a simplified version of an Australian model, but got very similar results to theirs. And I only, I'm highly sceptical of these models, as you might have uh, detected. Um, so i just um, uh, um, tell you about it, because actually they tend to be biased towards higher growth rather than lower growth. And, and the, the, what this predicted was surprisingly low. So they looked at modelling of a 5 percentage point cut in, a ca in company tax. So taking it from 28% down to 23% or something like that. That would increase net national product by just 0.1%. Um, and vice versa, if you thought about raising the tax by 5 percentage points, it would reduce net national product by just 0.1%. Net national product is a cousin of gross domestic product, the difference is that it takes into account that a lot of the, the income goes overseas to overseas investors and <coughs> takes out the effect of depreciation. Um, and the, one of the points here is that a lot of the benefit of a tax cut would go to overseas um, shareholders. Um, it probably overstates the case both for that reason and because it doesn't take into account the concentration of industry um, where some industries are making abnormal profits. Bill, did you discuss realigning the rates? Can we come back to that at the end? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it. But, yeah. Mm, try the right button. Um, there were a number, particularly in discussing these revenue neutral packages we were asked to, uh, to pre present to the government, we looked at a number of ways in which uh, companies could be to some extent compensated for an increase in capital and taxing their capital gains. Um, and I'll just go through them briefly. The first one was to allow deductions for what's called black hole expenditure. Um, this is not an astronomical uh, um, uh, you know, black hole or something, but it's about when a company spends, R &D, spends on R&D, if it produces a commercial product, then it can deduct uh, depreciation on that new product and, and on the cost of developing it. However, if, they, if it's unsuccessful, then that money is just, um, just gone, if you like, and they don't get any tax recognition of it. This would allow them to get a tax deduction for it, and it <coughs> encourages them to take more risks in R&D, which by and large is a good thing, but clearly you need to have some good protections around that to make sure it's not rorted. Um, we, we proposed reinstating depreciation on commercial buildings at a 1% depreciation rate. That depreciation was taken out in 2010 as a quid pro quo for the reduction in the company tax rate to 28%. Um, this would be very expensive. 1.46 billion, almost 1.5 billion dollars a year. Uh, my personal view on it is that we see right now the commercial property industry absolutely booming. They don't seem to be suffering from this 
very strong overseas interest in it is, to me, the case is not great. But um, it is greater for what are called multi-unit residential buildings, such as apartment buildings, because that would encourage further housing construction. And for seismic strengthening, at the moment, you can get deductions if your building gets damaged in an earthquake, and you have to fix them, but you can't get a deduction, or you can't get claim depreciation if the... Um, uh, if you spend money to prevent the building being damaged in advance of an earthquake. Um, there is a long list of the reductions in compliance costs, mainly benefiting small businesses. Um, you have heard the government announce a digital services tax on, the, on companies like Facebook and Google. Uh, we recommended that if enough other countries do the same. The European Union has recently announced it's going to do something like this, so I think that critical mass is pretty close. Um, and we also said that the government must also ensure, to the, to the extent possible, that New Zealand's double tax agreements and trade agreements do not unduly restrict our taxation options in these matters. Because we're kind of sandwiched between these two types of treaties and the options that we have. And there's a very na narrow range of options we have to tax these, uh, these companies. Unless we get an international agreement on that. And there are talks going on in the OECD about this. This is by far the best way to do it, an international agreement on how to tax these companies, um, how these talks may go on for a very long time, and with countries like the US as their home of Facebook and so on, uh, they may never want to agree to anything. So I, I think that there is a good case there to do something in the interim. It will help put pressure on get, get an agreement in the OECD. Moving on to savings, this wasn't a full review of savings. Uh, but the government wanted us to look at ways to encourage savings. Um, uh, taxing income from capital gains would reduce the, the tax on uh, the, the uh, return on savings, as you've probably heard in the news a bit. Um, but we shouldn't exaggerate this. Um, there is um, the Treasury calculated that the total tax per year on all managed funds, and the QE savings approximately half of those would be $90 million rising to $130 million per year. Now, if there, there are about 2.8 2 million Kiwi savers at the moment, so each of them would lose approximately, on, that, on average, approximately $25 per year. So this isn't huge. It does, it does mount up, but I, I, you know, this is not something to exaggerate. And in addition to that, we made, we made four suggestions that would offset that, and more than significantly more than offset any one of these four that um, we suggest, and I'll talk about them in a tick, um, would more than offset that, um, that effect from capital gains. All of them are aimed at helping low to middle income people, principally people on below $48,000 a year, um, which Kiwi, simpli uh, Sam Stubbs of Simplicity Kiwi Saver Scheme Managers has confirmed through calculations he did independently. So the, the four options were removing the employer superannuation contribution tax, so that's a tax on the contributions employees make to their employees' uh, superannuation. Um, for uh, members earning up to 48000 that would cost about $220 million per year. Just bear in mind, you know, we're talking about a loss of 100, up to 130 million a year through capital gains tax. So, as you can see, this more than outweighs that. Um, if you want to make sure that it, it doesn't, there's just, not just a cliff at 48,000 on the removal of this tax, you could phase it out up to 70,000, which of course has got a bit more. Um, currently, the top tax rate, 33%, gets a 5% reduction, and it's the tax rate. It pays on uh, high investment funds such as KiwiSaver, which we felt was unfair, and so we suggested that you you lower the tax rates for lower income savers um, by a similar amount, so that there'll be 5.5% for people on a 10.5% tax rate and 12.5% for people on a 17.5% tax rate. Obviously, very much focused on those lower income people, relatively cheap compared to those other things. Um, and um, you could increase the member tax credit, so that's the subsidy that the government gives directly to KiwiSaver uh, um, members, increase it from 50 cents per dollar of contribution to 75 cents. 
One thing that I really liked was this last one, which doesn't isn't aimed at compensating for um, taxing income on, cap on capital gains, but um, ensuring that people, when they go on parental leave, can continue to save. And so what it what it says is that the primary caregiver, KiwiSaver member, receives the full member tax credit in the year of the child's birth, regardless of their contribution. So they can stop contributions when they're at home, income gone down, uh, more costs coming in, um, and the government will continue to pay that. Personally, I think it should go wider than that. Beneficiaries, anyone looking after dependents should get that. Um, but that's, that's an excellent start, I think, and hopefully the government would, will take that up and, and expand it. Um, personal income tax, we weren't allowed to raise tax rates, as you know. Um, we recommended that the top tax rate should not be lower because it's already so low. Um, but we did recommend packages to help lower middle income families. Um, the lowest income families are best helped by the, um, the welfare system. Um, so we aimed this somewhat up the uh, income scale. Um, and we focused on raising the bottom threshold from 14,000. So if you've got an uh, income of less than 14,000, you're taxed at 10.5%, and in any income you earn up to 14,000 is taxed at 10.5%. If you raise that threshold, then that 10.5, that lower tax rate, um, benefits you for, for more of your income. So it's a way of distributing, of reducing taxes on low income um, uh, people. <coughs> Um, um, and we gave various options and there are many others that could be suggested and they, they gave um, income gains of up to $420 or $595 or 1120 depending on the option and, but, but the proportional increases uh, were greatest to low and middle income families one interesting finding was that if we raised the 17.5% rate to 20% it would actually concentrate this is this would result in this figure here, 1,120. It actually concentrates more of those tax reductions on those low-income families, um, but we are not allowed to do that. So um, that was simply a finding. The, um, and we recommended that beneficiaries should uh, get uh, equivalent increases to make it fair. Um, ministers were specifically asked us... Um, they were concerned that good information on very high income and very high wealth in New Zealand is very scarce and not particularly reliable, and asked us if we had any ways of improving that. So we recommended four actions. One was to improve the Household Economic Survey, which is our main wealth survey now, so that it provides better data on, on the wealthy, so you'd, you'd sample it so that a lot more of the... the survey, um, the people surveyed were in that high income and wealth uh, bracket. You could include a question on wealth in the census. Um, and then Revenue, a couple of years ago, uh, did an analysis of, of, of the tax paid by high wealth and, um, individuals, and you can see it on the website there. Um, we, we asked that that be regularly repeated and that, you, that the Commission research on estimating the wealth of individuals from other data we have, such as income data, see if you could impute wealth from that other kind, those other types of, uh, of data. And we recommended greatly expanded information on tax, um, on the tax system, which is very weak in New Zealand compared to countries like Australia. Um, and we recommended um, that ways to stop cheating on the tax system. Um, one of those, um, at the same time as we were working, a report was released from Victoria University that estimated that the self-employed underreported their incomes by an average of 20%. Um, and so there are some options that, we, that could be used, such as data matching, um, requiring tax <coughs> to be paid on payments to contractors, so a bit like a PAYE or withholding tax, and increased reporting requirements on labour income. Um, the tax enforcers have the same problem that we have in the employment and health and safety space, that when a company gets fined or caught evading tax or fined for bad health and safety practices of exploiting their workers, very frequently they simply disappear and get set up again under another name and avoid paying taxes, uh, paying fines for that reason. 
and, and the same is happening in the tax space. So there were some suggestions there of, uh, of shedding it home to directors. Um, we suggested a Crown collection agency with consistent rules for treatment of debtors because there's a very, very bad uh, uh, difference in enforcement standards for, between taxpayers and, and beneficiaries who are uh, accused of um, fraud or, or whatever. Uh, this has been well, um, well documented. Um, better enforcement where wealthy company owners use their companies to avoid tax. Um, and, and, and again, this is partly using capital, um, the fact that capital gains is untaxed. Um, and government, to, and this partly answers your question, David, the government is asked to explore options to allow, allow a wider gap between the company and top personal tax rates without opening more opportunities for rorts like this. Um, there are two interests in this. My interest is in raise, as you might have might have uh, perceived, that uh, I'd like to raise top tax rates, and that would open that gap. But the other interest is that some people would like to lower the company tax rate, and that would open that gap too. So there's a mutuality of interest, mutuality of interests here, in, in finding ways to make sure that that gap is not used to rot the system. Um, and, and finally, um, inland revenue has been, its staffing has been depleted in recent years, and we've made a, we said, look, we really need good staff and enough staff and in IRD to, to look after the system. So, finally, and how are we going for time? Do you want to make another five to ten minutes? Five to ten, right, okay. Um, I've, now, I've, so I've finished with looking at at taxing income from capital gains. So capital gain is a rise in the price of that asset, basically. Um, and it's a form of income. It leaves the owner more wealthy. Just if you've got some unspent income and, and, and you put it in the bank or you, you buy some kind of asset with it, um, you are more wealthy. It's just another form of income, and it should not be distinguished from it. And economists and tax experts all, all agree on that, and, and in many ways it's embedded in our accounting rules as well. Now, um, in, in general, tax is, um, is exacted, is, is, the, the um, capital gain is taxed when the asset is sold, that's in, in these terms, in uh, the jargon, on realisation. Um, it proved not, pot, not to be possible, the tax fund managers told us, for most managed funds. Um, in that case, it's taxed on an annual revaluation, so, so called on accrual. Um, they said it wasn't possible to do it any other way. Virtually all other countries have had a capital gains tax for many years, and for many of them for many decades, and they're no longer contentious there. So, as Michael Cullen put it, either we are very smart not having one, or we are very stupid. You take your, you take your choice. <coughs> and as a Canadian professor told Ray New Zealand just in the last few days, we would be joining the modern world tax-wise if we had a capital gains tax. Um, the main reason for having a capital gains tax is fairness. And I've already talked about one of them, reducing inequality. But there's also, that's called vertical inequality. There's another form of, of um, inequity, which is horizontal inequity. Given that's another, just another form of income, ought to be taxed in the same way as any other forms of income. Now, if you just think about this example, Rowi works hard in the forestry industry. Over the last five years, he's earned $250,000, about $50,000 a year. He's automatically taxed close to $8,000 each year. Over that's over $40,000 over, over five years. Tracy is a property investor and made $250,000 on the sale of a rental house purchased just over five years ago. She pays zero tax. Why, why aren't they taxed the same? It's used, as I've said, by the wealthy to avoid existing taxes to convert in income to capital gains, which is another area of its um, unfairness. And there's an aspect of what you know, we're talking about now in the future of work, namely that if the share of the nation's income going to wage and salary earners 
continues to fall, whether it's due to automation or whether it's due to globalisation or whether it's due to uh, bad employment laws, then the importance of tax and capital is only going to increase. We can't simply keep on loading taxes on workers if their incomes are already under pressure in, in these trends. And this, this is just a quick picture of, of this effect. So you see up the top left, wage and salary income, share of the total income of the nation. And you see that through the, since the 1980s, it's, it's uh, fallen um, and it can, has continued to fall since about 2009. The same has happened to the unemployed. Their share is now at its lowest level uh, since, not, at least certainly since 1939. Um, and the main beneficiary has been corporate income, <coughs> company income. So, a few of the issues that have been raised in the media are my responses to them. And I won't be able to get through all of them, but we can come to some of them as you ask, ask questions. I'll be watching far away from our... Uh, so. <laughs> um, so, will the tax hurt, hurt investment? Well, there's two parts to this. Firstly, we currently subsidise investment in assets that produce a capital gain, um, such as land. We subsidise it by not taxing it. So that encourages overinvestment, encourages an inflation of the prices of those assets rather than adding to uh, productive capacity. When the price of land goes up, it doesn't increase the amount of land New Zealand has, it simply inflates the price. So it's a drag on productivity. So taxing all income equally encourages investment in more productive assets. This is called by economists allocated efficiency. That you, get, you make sure that your resources are allocated to the most effective use of them, the most efficient use of them. So would it have hurt other investment because it raises the effective company tax rate? And it will raise the effective company tax rate we have. We were given examples, and you can find them on the web, um, of, uh, of some parts of the, uh, uh, of some industries where companies are taxed at very low rates. And it's largely because they have, uh, their, their assets are mainly land or financial assets as opposed to productive assets. So I find this unconvincing. <coughs> as I said before, falling company taxes have not raised investment performance. In my view, taxation, you can talk about in theory, but in practice is simply not a major factor. There are many other things going on in the economy that are far more important in terms of the impact on investment and, uh, and productivity and so on. Secondly, the higher taxes, as I've said, will mainly be paid by investments with, with high capital gains components in them such as land or financial assets. And to a large extent, particularly for land, we want to balance away from, rebalance away from those anyway. So this is simply part of the effect that we want. Most country, OECD countries, as I've already said, tax capital gains income, but if have better productivity performance than New Zealand. So this is not a colour in terms of New Zealand's economic performance. What will be the effect on small businesses? Well, we propose several features that greatly reduce the effect on small business unless they are renting out property or trading in shares, which are known as passive assets. With, for firms of less than $5 million turnover a year, uh, the proposal is for what's called rollover of, for active assets, it's those productive assets, that they sell to replace them. So, for example, a farmer will be able to sell a farm and buy a larger one without any, capital, any, any taxation on the capital gain made um, in that process. A mechanic could sell a building used as a workshop to buy a larger one. Tax would only be paid if it, the asset was sold um, and not replaced. And at that point, the tax would be paid on the total gain between the first asset that the, uh, the business bought and the price that they got for that, that final asset sale. 
that that's, the, that's what's called rollover. You don't, you, you delay the uh, payment of the capital gains, the, the tax on the, that income from capital gains um, until this final stage. If the business is sold at retirement, up to 500,000 of the capital gain would be treated like a KiwiSaver investment in tax at its concessionary rate. And if the business is passed to a successor on the owner's death, the tax is again rolled over. So taxation may be deferred for decades or even generations under these recommendations. Now, you may have your views on that, but that was a recommendation, and I think that this, these things are extraordinarily favourable to these small businesses. Um, even for property investors, the tax working group suggested that while the government is currently considering mainly um, loss ring, ring fencing for property investors, should be cancelled because the capital gains tax in a way does a similar job. Here we go. Sorry? If you can find it. Okay. So, look, um, I've got another, a number of FAQs here, and by popular demand, we can discuss some of them, but I'll just go through the headings quickly and you can see what I've got here. What will it do to rents and house prices? My answer is very little. Uh, should capital gains be taxed the same rate as other income? And it's the same, it's income, so why should it be taxed differently? We've taxed capital, what capital gains, we've, um, income that we've had in the past, the bright line rule and so on. We've always taxed that at the standard rates. Why would we tax this any different, differently? If we tax at a different rate, we just continue the unfairness and problems and tax loopholes. Is it complex? Yes, but our current co tax system is complex too. We've got four and a half thousand pages of indescribably complex. There's one or two people in the room who can understand it, but um, <laughs> uh, most mortals will find it very difficult to understand it. Uh, for our supposedly simple tax system, and the, that, the, the uh, legislation is only the beginning. Other countries manage it. We did a survey of, uh, um, we, we found a survey of Australian firms which showed uh, actually the compliance costs were very low indeed, and about 2% of um, tax compliance costs it only occurs infrequently and um, even less for the smallest <coughs> businesses. Um, will it be the end of the Kiwi batch? Well, no, because I think the Kiwi batch is already. Uh, that dream has already gone. Um, and there's more and more of them are being rented out or Airbnb'd out. There's, there's, a, there's no dividing line between a, what we think of as the, the, the Kiwi batch dream and uh, other investment property. It's very hard to draw any distinction there. Uh, isn't it unfair that a $400,000 rental property gets taxed but a $10 million family home in Parnell doesn't, yeah, I'm very sorry for you, John Key, um, but um, it's less unfair if you compare it to a $400,000 family home. Um, one is a source of profit, one is a necessity, so there is a difference there, I think. But basically this is a feature of the system that all countries have, because it's simply electorally impossible to have a capital gains tax without exempting the family home. And we could talk about that more. Um, won't the rich just avoid it? Yeah, of course they would. Well, they try to avoid taxes generally. Um, it's nothing new. We, did, we need to make sure our ideas got the wherewithal to, to stop it. Don't small business owners work long hours for little effort? Well, some do. Some get a very handsome reward. Um, but wage and salary earners work hard and pay tax on their incomes as well. So, the end... <laughs> um, we need major work on our tax system to make it capable of reducing New Zealand's high inequality. Taxing ca income from capital gains will be a step in that direction, but there will be much more that we need to do to make our society a fairer place. Thank you.